The Able to Care podcast is sponsored by Able Training Support Limited, who build partnerships with organisations to develop confidence and competence in their team to promote positive outcomes for all. Find the link in the description. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Able to Care podcast. I am your host, Andy Baker, and joining me today is Hayley Cameron, who has joined us from, well, from the south of the country somewhere, Sutton, I believe is where you're coming from. So Hayley is a safeguarding specialist with a master's degree in child protection. She's worked as a designated safeguarding lead and acting head of school, director of safeguarding, is now the education safeguarding manager at Cognus Limited. Um, Hayley has an absolute passion for safeguarding and is a true believer in everyone having knowledge, skills and confidence and and well-being as well, I think we're going to be talking about, to ensure safeguarding is upheld. So thank you so much for joining us on this this day, Hayley. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Absolutely, my pleasure. So Hayley and I met on an event um, with uh, a a few other individuals who are going to be on podcasts and uh, things like that. And we kind of connected over that and, and we've kind of been interacting with each other for a little while over LinkedIn, haven't we, and stuff. So uh, yeah, we're kind of big big supporters of each other, which is really good. So it's lovely to have you on. Um, yeah, amazing, so see, amazing things happen, Andy, and that's it. For a network event, lots can happen. 100%, 100%. So we're also going to talk about safeguarding on this particular episode because this is your speciality. So we might as well absorb as much of your knowledge as we possibly can. Um, and I know it's an area you're very passionate about. So, but obviously, why? What drew you towards safeguarding? What's the reason you care so much about it? Okay, so if I can take you back, take you back, um, wow, almost, yeah, 30 years, I'd say. So, um 34 years, I was 10. Um, and I remember being at home in my um, bedroom, meant to be going to bed, messing around with my sister. It was quite late. Um, and I heard the, the telephone ring. And again, when the telephone rings really late at night, you kind of think that's a bit strange. But again, as a 10 year old, didn't really think much of it. What happened next stays with me forever. So I heard my dad cry the first time um I'd, I'd never heard my dad cry and then I heard my mum and I can only describe it as as a shriek um and at that moment I knew something was terribly wrong um so I went downstairs and basically my my aunt who was 26 um she had mental health issues. She'd been in abusive relationships, um, but she had been murdered by her partner. Um, yeah, she, again, was in a domestic abusive relationship. Um, and that phone call was somebody saying that she'd passed away. Um, now, the, the thing is, again, I was 10 and, you know, the emotions and everything else, I didn't really know how to interpret them, but I could just see that everyone around me was absolutely devastated. I wouldn't be seeing my crazy auntie Maria anymore. But the thing is, Andy, she had um, two children. So um, she had uh, Tina and and Brian. Um, again, they were both under five. Um, and that was obviously the the biggest focus for the whole whole family, and I guess you're you're dealing with the shock of hearing what's happened, but then you're thinking, hang on, there are there are two children here, um, and I guess what what happened then is we received a phone call from a social worker who had said that Tina and Brian would be um, being removed and put into care. Um, and I guess at that point, everything changed. My my mum was like, absolutely not. We're, yeah, we'll be there. So I guess overnight, my parents became foster um, carers. Um, and I became that protective factor. I just saw this baby, this young child who'd been through so, so much. And I guess I just wanted to protect her. Um, and, you know, the same with Brian. He went to live with my granddad. They had a house full of boys. And Tina came to live with us. So, um yeah, we were a very, very close family, but I would say that is when it all first started because I took on that, nobody asked me to, but I took on that um, caring responsibility. I guess 
I guess I wanted to make up for what had happened. And, and of course, you can't. You, you just can't. Um, probably overcompensated and still do to this day in ways that I shouldn't. Um, but I know for sure that's where it came from. So um, I guess, yeah, from that moment, I decided, right, OK, I want to go into schools. I want to teach. I want to help children. Because, you know, again, Maria's children struggled um, in school. Um, Obviously, there was a lot of trauma and 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 things, but it, it wasn't really recognised back then. And we were always told, you know, it's poor behaviour and um, they're being defiant. And it, it just, it didn't work for them. Um, so I thought if I go into teaching, I can fix the world. Yeah. As many teachers, I think, do. I think many go in with that passion and and uh, hope. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I really wanted to create a difference. And I guess... You know, I I did. I started off in the early years, um, and I just loved every second of it. Um, very quickly, kind of, um, sort of became foundation stage coordinator, assistant head teacher. How it all kind of moves, um, and I found myself um, working in pastoral care. So any of the roles, you know, I, I became um, safeguarding lead. Um, so I guess another turning point for me. Um, was all the way back in yeah, October 2013. Uh, I was a safeguarding lead. I'm at a school in Sutton and a child that I was working with um, was tragically murdered during the October half term by her dad. Um, Andy, all I can say is at that time, everything literally stood still. Um, it, it was the October half term I was doing what teachers do, you know, the, the weekly shop, opticians appointments, things like that. Nothing too too exciting. Um, had my niece with me. Um, she was, yeah, very young at the time. Uh, but she remembered the phone call came through. Um, and, you know, you, you remember, I remember the song that was playing on the radio. I remember the look on my niece's face. That utter sense of this is not meant to happen. Um, you know, absolutely not meant to happen. And I think from that point, you know, you go through a whole process. Anyone working in safeguarding, you want to believe that you can make a difference. You want to believe that you can protect children. Um, obviously, you know, we can do our very best. We can make sure policies are up to date, practice, there's supervision in place. Um, you know, the, the voice of the child is heard, but you can never determine what is going to happen behind closed doors in holidays when you're not there. Um, and that can be really, really difficult to, to take. I mean, I completely understand, like, for anybody in any role within a school, if you have a knowledge of a child, just generally have a knowledge of a child, or anybody, I suppose, isn't it? And, and it's that sudden, unexpected loss that there's going to be a huge emotional connection to that anyway. So anybody, I should imagine, that was involved in that child's life, it must have it massively affected them. Do you think there is a, uh, a difference when you, when you have that responsibility of, of safeguarding or a teacher or anything where you, you, I'm supposed to know this child, I'm supposed to know this safeguarding or I'm supposed to do things. Do you think there's a difference? Do you think it adds to the impact a little bit? Does, it, does some guilt come in there at some point? Oh, you know, absolutely. And I think for anyone, any teacher, uh, it could be a midday supervisor, it could be a caretaker, anyone working with, with children, I think, you know, they... They care. They want to make a difference. They want to protect. So whoever it is, for that to happen, it, it will definitely have an impact. And I think um, with the, you know, the case that I'm talking about, um, it was the impact on the, the school community. Um, you saw a, a certain sense of vulnerability in the staff around you that you, you hadn't seen. And I guess, you know, it, it was... Um, it happened in the half term. So the first day back, we're all, you know, all together, all the staff. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of upset. Um, we had educational psychologists in to talk through and, and how we were feeling. But at the same time, the bell rang and we've got all of these children outside waiting to come back in. They've been on half term there, you know, schools very often they're safe, happy place. And you have to kind of put on um, a role, a mask, no matter what you're feeling, you step outside. And, and that's exactly what happened. Um, I think that the children themselves, remember, they're six, they were six years old. Um, 
And we were aware that it was in the press. People had been talking about it. They would have heard things from their own families. And we had to be really careful because I think, you know, you don't want to say it's not happened, but they realise their friend's not back. They've heard certain things. But how much do you tell them? Um, also knowing, as I said, they would have had conversations with their families or that was about to happen. Um, but you didn't want to kind of dismiss what they were saying or how they were feeling. Um, so I think that was really difficult. But you you mentioned um, you mentioned blame, and absolutely, I, I think again as all staff members, but designated safeguarding leads, safeguarding teams, you really do take on that responsibility. And and we know that safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. But you you sit there and you think, hang on, we're meant to protect. What did we miss? How did I not know? Uh, could I have done anything different? Um, and I think you also get the local community you get a lot of support but you also get comments um you know how did that happen what was the school doing um the the local press shows a really keen interest and if you're feeling vulnerable it's an emotive time that can be just so so hard on yeah anyone working with with those children you know you you all kind of you you, you question yourself 100%. 100%. I think it's such a, um, it is such an emotive subject. I should imagine something, especially when they're, uh, the, the self-reflection, I've always felt that with, with some of the major like ca- cases, you know, some of the ones that have been in the press where there has been a death of a child and, you know, sometimes there has been blame being thrown around towards either social workers or teachers or, you know, anybody involved in that child's life. And although it doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't there has been mistakes made in some of the big cases out there as far as people not doing their job properly or not flagging things properly and stuff like that. My heart goes out sometimes to to kind of the level of guilt or the level of kind of um, how you must feel afterwards to kind of go constantly questioning, why didn't I do that? Why couldn't I have done more? It was easy to miss. You know, it's it's sometimes we're all too close to a situation to potentially notice kind of, around the safeguarding aspect, isn't it? And I think that's where, from from uh, the knowledge I have safeguarding, it's, it's, it does require a teamwork approach to some degree or another. It's not down to one individual necessarily, as long as there's good communication across uh, from that individual out. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. You need to, you need to build the safeguarding capacity within your, your schools, your teams, so it's not all on one person. I think there's that appreciation of, of different agencies. And of course, You know, as you said, you know, you you turn on the TV, you open the newspaper, and we know there have been huge advances in multi-agency working, in safeguarding in general. But you hear the same tragedies happening time and time again. And every time you do, the learning is the same. And you kind of sit there and think, how can this be happening? Um, But I think, you know, you can go all the way back to um, the death of Maria Colwell um, in 1974, um, Daniel Pelka, Victoria Columbia, you know, all of those. And then more recently, you know, um, Ellie Butler. Um, and I think there are so many similarities. And I think that's what really struck a chord within me. And I guess what happened when when all of this happened, you, you clearly know that you can't change the past, but you it, it ignited something within me where, yep, yeah, you can't change the past, but I wanted to do all I could to kind of change what happens going forward. And and some people do say, you know, you can't fix the world. I really, I do appreciate that. I know that. Um, but you can still make a significant difference and, and provide, you know, support for anyone working in safeguarding. It can be really difficult. It can be really isolating. Um, I, I remember, when, again, when you're talking about blame, um, I remember going, I couldn't talk about that case for a long time, years. I just couldn't um, talk about it. Um, But I also didn't want what had happened to be diluted or anything else. And there was a real important message there. And I think people really needed to hear it. So I I started to, um, yeah, use the case as an an example in my training. And I remember being stood in front of maybe, I don't know, 50 designated safeguarding leads. And the training was going really well. They were absolutely, you know, captivated by what, what I was saying, what had happened. But then one person, I was so not prepared for this, they put their hand up and they said, um, but didn't you blame yourself? How could you not know that was going on? Yeah. And I wasn't, I, I, 
I felt really, well, it was emotive. And I thought, yeah. Do you know what, actually, at first I thought, how could you ask me that? Mm. But now on reflection, I'm really glad that they did. Because, of course, everyone is asking that question. And you yeah. ask those questions of yourself. And I think when you put it out there, and I think this is why I really was so pleased I could talk today. I think it's so important that as professionals, you do realise that you're human first. Mm. And, you know, yes, we have a role. And, you know, yes, you have to get on with your job and you have to do all of these things. But it's so important to validate your feelings. So, you know, I said to them, you know, absolutely. There were sleepless nights. There were things that make you question, should I be in safeguarding? Should I do a different job completely? Um, And... And I think it was just the shock on everyone's faces because I could have said something completely different and yeah. got defensive. There's no need for that. You know, right. it's there's learning from every case you're involved in. And mm. I think that's what stays with me. And I think for everyone, when you were talking about agencies and, and of course, sometimes people get it wrong, I think it can be really hard to admit that you, you've got something wrong, mm. but it's, Again, you can't change what's happened, but you can change what happens going forward. So policies, practices, multi-agency working, obtaining the voice of the child, you know, those relationships, yeah. those things. And I think that's um, what I've kind of been striving um, to achieve. So I think there's an aspect that there's ebbs and flows a little bit with things like safeguarding in the fact that they'll kind of be... In the media, there'll be a major case and then suddenly everybody going, oh, you've messed up. Look what you should have done. Look how you should have managed it. Look what you should have done better. Look how you've let people down. So then everybody amps things up a little bit, but then you get the case of you've done that and it wasn't appropriate and you've impacted on that family and, and stuff. And then everybody kind of, well, oh, we're being a bit oversensitive. We're being a bit too far. And then it constantly goes up and down like this based on what's in the media and what's in cases. And I think there's that guilt that you feel, isn't there, as you just described there, of the time that I missed it, the time, you know, and I'm not saying this was obviously down to you in this circumstance, but what did we miss? Why didn't we pick that up? Why didn't I make that decision at that time? But I've also heard it from a person who was a safeguarding lead. They said, you know, I've made three um, allegations against families where they've been investigated. And in two of the cases, it turned out that I was right and there was major concerns and things need to be put in place to improve the well-being of the parents and the children. But it was the one I got wrong that I can't, I struggle to let go because there was actually nothing wrong in this family, but they were still kind of investigated. They were still kind of it impacted on the family dynamics. The, the couple ended up falling out and, and that's the one I feel so guilty about. And I think this is for some people, there is a, I think there's two negative sides to safeguarding sometimes, because I think obviously it's so important and we are all, most people, not, I say, won't say all, most people are genuinely interested in the well-being of children and want the best outcomes for children. I have to say most, because we can't, we can't completely generalise. Um, but I think there has, there's two aspects. One is I think there is many parents and caregivers out there um, where safeguarding is that we're constantly being scrutinized. We're constantly being judged. And, and I had a, uh, we had a situation recently with, with a close friend of mine who basically a, a child had made a comment and this comment had been taken potentially out of context by one person. It had suddenly been flagged up the system. My, my friend was then getting contacted by a member of the staff going, this has been said and we, we need to contact this and the other. You need to give a justification and you're not going to be allowed your children back tonight if you can't then kind of put. And that I think there's so many parents out there that are generally terrified of, I step out of line, I do one thing wrong. A child gets a bruise when they fall over. I'm scared to let them play football now because what will safeguarding say? And then you've also got the, the negative slant of it. And I remember this when I first started teaching things like health and safety, that everybody was so negative on health and safety because of the myths of health and safety. Like they're banning conkers from schools now and it's ridiculous. And like, like conkers was never banned from schools. There's no conquer act of 2009 saying it's illegal to play conkers. Some schools went, we're not having it here, but it's up to you if you play it elsewhere. Um, but I think sometimes safeguarding's almost become the new health and safety. A little bit of his all bureaucracy and it's red tape and and this and the other and it's taken away our ability to just enjoy like being around children, enjoying children. Like I know if I was to go to a playground just because I enjoy children, the sound of children playing, I wouldn't be able to go because I immediately I'd go, they'd be calling the police on me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? 
unless I've got a child with me or, or there's a reason that I'm there, I'm getting the police called on me if I just, it, and I remember, I remember my granddad sometimes enjoying just the sound of children. And isn't that nice that I love watching them play for a little bit. And it's, I, that's where I'm kind of like, I think there's an ebb and flow. So what are your feelings on that? It can be really, really difficult. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned those cases. Of course, there are cases where you you follow up and and, and report how, how you're meant to. And actually something is going on. And, and it might not be, you know, deemed high level, but actually mm. maybe the family are needing some support. And actually the family, they might get angry with you. But in the end, yeah, we do need help. And, and I think there's that thing of building those relationships with the families. Um, mm try and help them understand so that actually if they are struggling you don't want them to be scared to come and tell you you want them to open up because we want to be in this together you know social care don't want to come and take your children away um but if you need that help and we know what's going on we can do something about it we can signpost now we know services are stretched um on the other hand when something's reported and then the family the relationship breaks down now as teachers you can spend years building relationships with mm. particular families and it can all be crushed in an instant. Yeah. And you, over the years, I've had many conversations with safeguarding leads who say, do we have to report that in? Can I have a conversation with the family first? Because I know them, I know what this is going to do. And it's kind of, you know, we never know what's going on behind closed doors. And I think that's the biggest thing. So we always say that this has come in, you're acting in the best interest of the child. You may think you know the family, but just say you talk to the family and you said, oh, you know, um, Sophie said this today. Oh, no, that that didn't happen. But they go home and actually it had been happening. And what happens to Sophie then? And you've also yep. got the other side where actually the child will then be a bit like, I'm never telling you anything again. Because, mm -hmm. you know, so it's really, really hard. I, I do get it. I think sometimes you can look at things and think, let children be children. Um, and, of course, it's that awareness of children do fall over they get scrapes they get bruises you know they make comments it's not always in context but all we can do as professionals is really sort of unpick still pass that information on share what you do know of the family I think that's really important as well you know it's I know you can't um you've got to be factual and that's you know really important um but if you do know a bit about the, the dynamics of the family and the engagement of the family you know we don't always want to focus on the negatives we want to focus on the, the strengths and as I said especially now since the pandemic even before the pandemic but the pandemic then the cost of living crisis people are struggling and um, I think it's that appreciation um, and trying to show people that we're working together rather than against others. Mm. Yeah I think there is that perception isn't there that, that safeguarding or the concept of safeguarding in a local authority is there to kind of punish. It's almost, a, that, I think that's the mentality, isn't it? If a, if a safeguarding is raised on a child, the idea is that then the parents will be punished by removing that child or taking that child away or they'll be chastised. Or I say the way the situation was managed with my particular friend was exactly as you said, why was she being asked? Because either it's severe enough to actually flag on so it shouldn't have been a teacher talking to her or it wasn't severe enough. And therefore, why was a conversation happening in that way? Um, but I think even things like, um, well, I, I think there was a comment made, like, I would suggest that you do some um, behavioral parenting classes. And, and this lady had, had done my behavioral parenting class and she was perfectly proficient and competent and stuff like that. And it was, um, and that really got a backup as far as like, I know this stuff. Um, but I think that's the, that's that. Those negative events are what sticks out in people's heads, aren't they? And I yeah. think with the safeguarding, it isn't just about removing children from households. It is about, okay, it may not be that it's your fault that things aren't quite right for your child. So the idea is that we are better able to support. Um, it's the same like with the prevent duty. You had a lot of people going, oh, if we flag somebody up related to potential radicalization, then they're going to be punished and put in prison. Well, no, it's not. It's about a re-education process. It's about a support process. It's looking at what's right and what's not right for them. But I think the media so often is, again, I'm going to blame the media for everything, but <laughs> so often people generally, let's not blame the media, people generally pick up the worst case scenario and focus on the negative rather than the positive case. You never hear in the new media about family was struggling to look after their child with additional needs. Um, the child was not, you know, the parents were not able to support that child's well-being appropriately. So safeguarding got involved. 
local authority got involved and offered this mentorship program where they then helped the parents and the child to then overcome and now they're living, to, they're living together and happily ever after. You never hear about that. No, no, exactly. And, and, and you don't. And I think that's what makes, you know, I, and I, I, I truly say this and mean this, I work with such a strong um, DSL network in Sutton. Um, they're incredible. They are absolutely incredible. They go above and beyond, you know, over and above all of the time. And the asks on them constantly increase. And I think for me, it's, you know, I have those conversations where people say, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. I still feel like I'm not doing enough. They never feel like they're doing enough. And But what if we miss something? And actually, I could have done better. And we can all look at things like that. And of course, you know, I just think it's so important. Yes, you have the learning, but also focus on what you are doing. You know, you do make a difference. You could have a whole list of things to do. And then all of a sudden, a disclosure comes in. You've got to act on that disclosure. Everything else kind of goes out of the window. And I think... um, you know, just having those honest, open conversations. Like, I, I love it. I, I encourage the DSL, phone me up. We'll talk it through. I've got a great team that I work with. Um, and, you know, we're all there to offer support and advice. Mm. Um, again, Andy, we don't always get it right. We don't always have all of the answers. Yeah. But we all know where to signpost or we can talk something through. And sometimes hearing something from somebody else who's not as close to a situation can make you understand things better or just broaden your thinking and and actually Mm. yeah I I need to do a referral here um but but I think it you know I've said about the the strong DSL network but also within Sutton you know Cognus um the company that I work for are commissioned by the uh, London Borough of Sutton to um provide education services um the partnership working and the strengths between the teams and that's health police social care and education we really do come together and I think I think that strengthened in the pandemic because we had to work in very different ways. Mm. Um, We tried to build any bridges and actually really open up that communication. So where you sit there and say, oh, it's a social worker's fault, it's the police, uh, you know, not not enough staff, or Mm. what were education doing? We've moved away from that. You know, of course, you still get comments, but actually, if there is a comment, we come together and say, okay, this is what happened. What could have been better? Let's find a solution. And And you really do get that strong sense of togetherness. And I think that's so important because, as I said, it's a motive. You don't want to get things wrong. If you do get things wrong, things can be extremely serious. Um, And, you know, it's about coming together, doing your absolute best and believing that you are doing your best. As I said, you, you, you can't always determine what's going to happen, but you can put things in place have those conversations um, and, and feel that you're getting your voice heard and any concerns that you have. Thank you for listening to the Able to Care podcast. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, comment and share. We really appreciate all of you listeners. So what, what would you say are probably what you perceive from your experience are the biggest hurdles or misunderstandings around safeguarding? I'd say, you know, that the things that come up time and time again is, you know, when when you look at um, safeguarding practice reviews or you you hear of incidents that are happening, it still comes up about multi-agency working. It still comes up about voice of the child. Um, And I think, you know, there needs to be a huge push. As I said, there have been huge advances and, and it's something we really focus on. Always try and get that voice of the child, but also try and get the voice of, you know, the siblings. Try and understand the family the family context, that that bigger picture. Um, And, you know, obviously if a child is saying something to you, they need to feel that they're listened to. I think, you know, a a big hurdle, as always, is um, the complexity of cases that come in. Um, Thresholds are always, you know, difficult for for meeting um, statutory services. Um, But again, we have lots of conversations around that. But what comes with that is the level of work that um, people working in safeguarding are facing. And and especially in schools, because that's something I work closely with. And, and, you know, as I said, have those conversations daily. It's the, yeah, it's the capacity. I think that importance of building the capacity to be able to solve these problems. Because as we know, in schools, very often you're not just a safeguarding lead. You'll have a teaching commitment. You'll be on lunch duty. You'll be on on gate duty you need to have a team around you so that you you feel supported um i think that that risk of burnout is is real um i i really do think that that's real and i think it kind of leads me to what i'm talking about today i think there's such an important 
One, that, you know, the, the safeguarding teams, anyone working with children has that platform, that safe, reflective space for supervision where they can just talk things through, you know, that they're able to validate their feelings, not related to performance management or anything like that. Because people often say, oh, you know, actually, I can't say that because I should be stronger or or will that impact on my job? But just that platform to recognise, do you know what? You're human first. We've all got things going on in life outside. And I know you're meant to draw the line and go in. That's not always easy. And sometimes there'll be triggers for people. So I think, you know, the, the biggest challenge is encouraging and and telling staff about the importance of supervision, making that accessible. Obviously, budgets um, don't always allow that. Um, but that's something I'm, I'm thinking creatively at the moment with, with Cogness. Um, but we really feel that that's so important because, as, as we say, you can't pour from an empty cup and your cup needs to be overflowing in order to serve others. So I think that really needs to be um, a focus because there's some incredible work going on and you don't want to lose the people that are, are, are doing those jobs. You know, you want them to feel upskilled, supported, um, and unfortunately, Andy, there are going to be situations like I described where things go horrifically wrong. But it's, again, it's not looking to blame anyone. It's taking the learning and, and seeing what you can do. But again, that people feel supported. You know, in, in the case that I was discussing, the serious case review happened, there was no fault found on the school. And everyone said, oh, you must be so relieved. And of course, you are. But that didn't matter because you still sit there and say, but do you know what? A child still died and that shouldn't have happened. So it's it's really, really difficult. And it, it, it's getting people to understand, you know, we can't fix everything. There are, as I said, thresholds. There are um, arrangements. You have to adhere to all of that. But in the middle of it, if you can get across, you know, the voice of the child, that family context, I think you're halfway there. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think there's there's a few things within that that you sort of said. Um, I think I think one of them is that that recognition of where your your limitations are. I think as the um, within that kind of role, you've got these major decisions to make that, as you said, they could be life changing. One way for the benefit, one way for the for the worse. So that's a huge amount of pressure to anybody, especially as a kind of the the person. If there is one person at the top of the hierarchy you know, going, do I refer this or do I not? And I know when we do DSL training and stuff, it's that, you know, giving people want very black and white answers sometimes. They're going, well, when do I refer? When do I not refer? Well, ah, well, this, but maybe sometimes ish, but <laughs> because it is so case by case. So that's a huge amount of stress that a person's got to kind of go through in that kind of capacity. But also it's the case of even when stuff is coming through, whether it be right or wrong, there's an awful lot of emotive stuff, as you mentioned there, as far as, you know, the well-being of children and the, the abuse or neglect of children are emotive subjects. So if you're hearing about this, thinking about this, being aware of this all the time, it's going to have a huge kind of impact on your overall psychology and well-being that you're, lo- you're almost looking out for the worst a little bit sometimes, aren't you? Which is going to affect your kind of your, your well-being and mentality. So I think it's really important to have that. Uh, that sense of community around. And I shouldn't imagine there is many organizations that necessarily necessarily kind of pick up on those, yeah, well, this is a this is a stressful job because they may only get like the occasional referral through most of the time. It's kind of life is quiet. It's long periods of boredom followed by intense periods of um uh, of emotion, I suppose, isn't it? So yeah. No, absolutely. And I feel really privileged to be in the role that I'm in because, I, as I said, I've been in, in Sutton 20 years now. So, um, you know, as a safeguarding lead in a school, actually seeing it all happen and now being able to support people in that same role. So I think it really, really helps because there are so many experiences and you learn from all of those experiences and just being able to talk things through those open, honest conversations happen and and it's not always so surreal. Sometimes people come in and they haven't got that, you know, that lived experience, I guess, um, and they do their absolute best. Um, But I think it's actually being in a role and then going on to support others in that role has, um, yeah, really, really helped. And I think, um, you know, we're we're lucky, as I said, within Cognis, there are over almost 30 services um, that we put out to schools and that could be, you know, 
send autism uh, virtual school, lots and lots of different services. Um, and they all support schools and children in different ways. But there's also a lot of communication. So we try and triangulate information. And if if we see a family that's struggling or somebody's mentioning something, there is somebody within Cognizant that can help. And I think that signposting is really important. Um, in terms of my team, so the education safeguarding team, we can provide the, you know, the safeguarding training, the support with Ofsted visits, managing allegations against staff, um, safeguarding review. So we, we do all of that, but as well, DSL supervision. So that's something that no matter where we are, the DSL network meetings we have, that communication is, is constant. The supervision will get mentioned at every single session, but just because I feel so strongly about it. That's a really interesting resource. So um, I, I obviously through you, I know of, of Cognos and stuff, and obviously that was uh, procured through the local authority. That's the case, isn't it? It's, yeah. Um, is that a common thing or is that, uh, has all local authorities got that in place or is that um, something a little bit, little bit different, a little bit specific? I think um, local authorities do things differently. Um, I think, you know, the services used to come from the local authority and then we were a bit of a, um, a spin-off, if you like. So, um, you know, we do work extremely closely with the local authority. And that's the thing that um, although we're, we're separate, we're very much joined as well in our thinking. And there are meetings, you know, several meetings every day in different services um, to, to really kind of um, move things forward in Sutton and actually to look at what are the asks what can we provide? How can that be provided? So I think, I, I do think, you know, we're in a privileged position in, in Sussex. So um, you mentioned a few a few things there that obviously you guys sort of uh, consult, supervise, you do lots of things for schools. Um, if we kind of, both schools and obviously residential children's homes and stuff like that, what, what can settings do to improve their safeguarding practice that's above and beyond just doing the mandatory training, which I think sometimes is, is for some places, it's the, yeah, yeah, that's done for the year. So what, yeah, what can be done to improve, do you think? I think um, it's reaching out to people in um, similar roles as you, so connecting, as we said, we met through a network event. Um, yeah. You know, there are lots of people in a very similar position. And yeah. of course, you can do your policy and you can go on your training, but there's something about talking to people outside of your setting, people who are in, you know, sim as you said, residential homes, find mm. enough residential homes, speak to their designated safeguard need, come together, build those networks. Mm. I think, you know, peer support, you learn a lot, a lot from that. Um, podcast listen to a podcast and um, join these networking events you know i know that time is so precious so mm. so precious but you can really get so much and it just takes one conversation with you know someone to make an mm. incredible difference i do find um i see i have a lot more experience with children's homes and schools schools are definitely better at kind of um like kind of working together a little bit more. There is a bit more of a sense of community. I do find quite often kind of within the residential children's homes, because they tend to be slightly different in the way they are commercially driven enterprises to some degree or another. I don't know many who necessarily connect with other children's homes. And yeah. I think that's a really good idea as far as I, I understand, obviously, it might be the instinct is, but what about data protection? But obviously there is ways of maintaining confidentiality and data protection while still having conversations about, I'm struggling with this at the minute, no names mentioned, but you know, what, what's the opinion or how can we manage this or what do you guys do? And yeah. I don't think it needs to be a competitive kind of, well, we go and talk to each other because they're competing. It, it could be like, well, how can we all improve, especially around the subject of safeguarding, because it isn't a competition. It's related to just well-being of children, which, you know, and I think, but I don't hear of that very often. No, exactly that. And I think there's that thing. And of course, and I know I do it and, and, mm. and we have these conversations, but you want to make yourself available to everyone at all times because... Mm. No, it's not a nine to five job. And sometimes something somebody will be struggling with something in the evening. There's that appreciation that we're not a blue light service. Obviously, yeah. we we are available and there, there are the police, there are social care. But I think we've created something where, um, again, exactly like you're saying, and it and it, it, it wouldn't take much. It just takes a few kind of connections. Mm. Um, 
a, like a peer WhatsApp group, for example. So we've yeah. got lots of designated safeguarding leads in Sutton who we, we're on the WhatsApp group, but it's not led by us. Basically, mm. if, if somebody has an issue in a school, um, no names are mentioned. It's not about individual specifics. It mm. might be that they're dealing with a case and they're looking for a particular service. Has anyone come across this? And the responses that you get, are fantastic or you know um we're looking for a policy or we're developing our policy really struggling with this and all of a sudden some people say we've got one take a look or you know do you want to meet up do you want a conversation i'll give you a call and again it's just about increasing those um support levels and knowing that you've got different avenues and people to go to if you need to um yeah yeah Definitely. I think there's um, one of the things that we're trying to put together is, is um, called the ablehub.uk. So we're starting this up and it is a, a kind of a membership service where there'll be like online training. And we're hoping to kind of, a bit like you said, and different to what Cognos do in many ways, but we want to have a safeguarding area where people can maybe have those conversations and, um, you know, have that little bit of a an anonymous peer support kind of situation with the forum. So yeah, that's something we're looking to try and develop because I think there is this this disconnect. I say schools are better at it than others, but whether it be elderly residential, whether it be children's homes, whether it be mental health, they just don't talk to each other. They're like just these separate islands um, that are all being governed by the same bodies. And I'm just saying they follow, follow the same rules, but otherwise very little to do with each other. So I think that's the fact that you've got that service and working within that service that you're kind of almost that hub for them to connect into is, uh, is, is definitely positive, isn't it? And some of the things that you offer. Okay. We try and be creative in our, in our thinking as well, going all the way back. Another thing that, and this is for anyone who, who is listening here, anyone who works in, in safeguarding, following um, the case that we were talking about of, mm. we held a, a reflective learning event and that had all different agencies and, of course, it didn't shock me. I knew that it would have a massive impact, but the impact was wider than I thought. You know, people who had no idea about this young person, no idea of the history or anything, and they wanted to do something. They wanted to create some kind of change. So um, we set up a, a working party with people actually working on the front line, so people who, who see the and hear these things every day. Mm. Um, and we created um, an animation um, and the animation is all in the voice of the child because, again, I said, you know, you don't want to dilute what's happened. You hear these cases, but what happens with the learning? So the animation kind of really focuses down on, on what you do um, for safeguarding day mm. in, day out. Um, and we, we had the animation and then we thought, actually, we want to do something else. So we created a toolkit um, and I'll, I'll share the details, but it's www.childsafeguardingtoolkit.org.uk. Um, and this resource, it was launched locally and nationally. Um, it's free for everyone to access. So I think that makes people smile even more. Yeah. But the idea behind it is, again, that people feel supported. So what's unique about the toolkit, it was created by the Sutton LSCP, um, and it's based on uh, real life scenarios. So often in training, case studies are made up to fit a particular message. These are real life um, stories, case studies that can be used within your own teams, um, guidance that's regularly updated. Uh, but what I'm you know, really, really proud of is also got some e-learning um, on there, which free to access, but it's all about learning from child safeguarding practice reviews. So it's something that you can go on with your team, watch the animations, do the learning, share it because everyone needs to feel supported. So I really hope we can get the toolkit far and wide. Yeah, definitely. We'll put a, uh, we'll make sure we put a link in the, uh, in the show notes. I've got it on my, my list of things we we're going to talk about. So, <laughs> <laughs> Cause I did go on that and it did look like a really good resource as far as you say, the e-learning, but also there's some, some real nice accessible as well. Um, kind of information, um, that isn't just pages and pages, a local authority description of what you should and shouldn't be doing. It definitely looked a little bit easier to digest than, uh, some of the, some of the other information I've seen on there about safeguarding. So um, we've gone through a little bit on kind of the biggest hurdles and, and we've talked a little bit about what well, you mentioned as far as the kind of connecting with other organisations to kind of pursue safeguarding. It'd be nice to kind of, um, what have you found works really well when we're looking at supporting those um, who are in that role or having to deal with safeguarding or especially maybe uh, kind of 
post incident, if there has been a a flag raised, whether it be a, a you know turns out to be a true or not. Um, and even, I suppose, within the elements of, of managing allegations as well, because I know that obviously a lot of employers don't always realise their responsibility as far as, you know, health and safety executive for the first time has brought out that the psychological well-being of staff should be included within first aid um, uh, requirements, for instance. So there's, they're starting to get a little bit more on this as far as like, yeah, you've got legal responsibility to make sure people for stress and for well-being is still considered. So what's your advice on that front as far as organisations and schools and et cetera is concerned? Staff wellbeing, there should be a whole variety of um, resources accessible to staff. I think um, have, and, and Cognos have, have been really good at this. Have those discussions with your staff. You know, a lot of organisations have things for wellbeing, but actually are they being used? Is it being promoted? Is it what the staff need? You know, Talk to your staff, find out what they need and see if there's something that you can, can put in place there. And I think sometimes just those, even those ad hoc conversations, you know what it's like, Andy, when somebody says, it could be the most stressful day ever. Somebody will say, hi, Andy, how are you? You say, yep, fine. Are you really fine? You know, but again, not pushing it because it's got to be when the person is ready. But if you notice they're a bit quiet or you know that they've had something really heavy going on, check in and, you know, let them know that you're there for them. And it, it, you don't want to overcrowd them. And some people may not want to talk about things. I used to be the worst person in terms of um, access and supervision. I would do anything in my power to be too busy somewhere else because I didn't want to stop and reflect. But sometimes, you know, once I accessed it, I never looked back. Never, ever looked back. Um, but I'm not even talking about full-blown supervision. You know, I think that's really important. The well-being is important. But sometimes just those unexpected check-ins, you know, a quick text or a quick phone call. Um, spreading acts of kindness, Andy, is, is what I would say, and, and making people realise that, you know, we all struggle too. I think when people share their experiences, sometimes the strongest of people, and people say, I never knew you were feeling like that, going through that. Um, and I know that we all have professional, um, you know, barriers and boundaries and and of course that's important what you know I, I think in one of your previous podcasts what you see you know in work people will see a certain perception of you the version of you at home is different of course it is and I'm not talking about blurring that or overstepping oversharing but just that realization that we are human first and it is more than about just our roles you know we're people too and we've got to look after ourselves, as I said earlier, in order to be able to provide for others. Yes, do you think it's, because um, I think it's an employer's responsibility to to a degree, and you said it's that, that exact thing, isn't it? They're going, how are you? I'm fine. But yeah, w the words do not match the body language. And we, but some people are really good at masking and really good at putting that stiff upper lip and I'm absolutely fine. Um, and I think because you mentioned there, there's some people who, who really do find it difficult to demonstrate any level of vulnerability to kind of go, yeah, this is emotionally affecting me because there's an element or a preconception that it shouldn't. It's my job. I should just be able to get on with this. It shouldn't be getting up on me. You know? um, so I suppose there's also a responsibility for employees as well, isn't there? To kind of like, to some degree, like allow yourself to be vulnerable, recognize those signs and symptoms of burnout or compassion fatigue and, and things like that. Um, to to know that you're not your best self right now, um, that 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 this could impact on the next the next case because I think that's always as well. I come across it quite a lot in in numerous services. Uh, one of the courses I teach is, that tends to be more specific around foster care is safer caring, and um, uh, and it's looking at kind of. I, I look at risk assessments and I look at risk assessments, not just your typical kind of health and safety orientated risk assessment, but then I always go, well, what about the benefit? In every behavior, there's a benefit, in every circumstance, there's a benefit. But if you've just been through, let's say you've just been through a major event, whether you're a, a member of school staff or you're a foster parent or a parent, where maybe there has been a, a CSE incident, a child sexual exploitation incident, for instance. Um, and especially if we're in a professional role, if you just had to deal with a, a child who's experienced you know, uh, criminal or, or child sexual exploitation, the next child that comes in, you're going to be a little bit hypersensitive to it. It's like the day, the day after you've seen a really bad accident, you probably think you're more likely to have an accident as far as a car crash is concerned. Do you know what I mean? It's the same thing, isn't it? Um, 
what do you think are the tools to help people with that, that, that hyper defensive and hyper kind of risk averse kind of mentality? You mentioned a really valid point there about vulnerability. And I think too often people wrongly see vulnerability or admitting that they're vulnerable as a sign of weakness. And they feel that it's going to stop them progressing or it will impact people. It will reflect badly. Um, I don't think it does at all. And I think that's where those conversations around well-being, staff well-being, uh, what different organisations can provide. I think be your authentic self, be open, be honest, be true, reach out because you'll be surprised about the level of support that's available for you and the amount of people that are also go in through something um, that perhaps you just don't know about. I would say there is no courage without fear um, in so much as, you know, vul vulnerability is, is being courageous for stepping outside that comfort zone and kind of being willing to admit that I'm, I'm finding this hard a little bit um, is definitely important. There was, um, I bet I was talking, and I think we might have cut off a little bit, but I was talking about the kind of the, the risk adverse. So as far as the, how, how do you think, uh, or what do you think people need to do if, if, if I've dealt with a situation around child sexual exploitation, and then I've got another child that may be mirroring certain behaviors. There's almost a trauma, isn't there? And suddenly, and I get a lot with professionals, they're hyper-focused on the risk rather than necessarily looking at the benefits. Like, you know, what's the benefit for a girl going out with her friends at the weekend? Well, it's socializing, feeling part and feeling included, developing social skills. But if you're really concerned about, yes, but she's also hung out with this this older man at this point and he's got a history of and she did that a few months ago, how can we keep her safe now? Yeah. How do you think people can, or what's the best method you know to help people overcome that risk-averse mentality? I think it's difficult. I'm not going to say it's easy at all. Uh, it's like a natural kind of instinct, if you like. Mm. But I think it's really important. Of course, you learn from every case, but seeing them as an individual case and, and assessing everything on an individual basis. And not every case will be the same. Um, of course, with anyone, you know, it's the same with your own teenagers when they start to want to go out places and you're thinking, no, you're never going out until you're 64. You know, it's, yeah. it's those kind of things. But you know that you've got to let them because if, you, if you're stopping them from doing these things, um, you know, you're not really giving them access to the real world. And I think mm. if you're worried about certain things, it's about making sure that young people are, equipped they're also aware of risks and they know what to do to keep themselves safe um there, there does have to be that that level of awareness if you're working with a parent a safeguarding lead you know a young person talk to that young person find out it, it may be that they actually say something that makes your concerns huge yeah and, yeah you know and then you do need to follow it through but i think talking with them and, and again this is why the the safeguarding training and the teaching of sensitive subjects for young people. So embedded across the curriculum, uh, training for parents, for staff, it's everyone. So that everyone should be on the same wavelength um, and thinking the same thing. So that not only are you having the discussions, start, you know, staff are having the discussions, pupils are aware of the risks that are out there. But also, and I know it wouldn't be all, but the majority of parents would also support you on that and, yeah. you know, want to make a difference. I think it's the way this approach, whether it's collaborative or again, judgmental kind of going in there at all, definitely. One of the things I find, um, and I don't know about yourself, that whether you've encountered some, some individuals really struggle with the whole concept of kind of risk assessment to some degree or another. Yeah. I find that I do a quite a few exercises. Some of the courses I teach are around things like um, uh, physical intervention, for instance. So, you know, and I use some scenarios that um, let's say you've got this young person who's going out and, and the kind of CSE example, like, would you stop them going? And I get them to a bit of a risk assessment. I often find like, what are the worries you have about her going? And we tend to have like, well, CSE, CCE, sexual abuse, da, da, da. And I try and get them to think, but is that a hazard or is that a risk? And I think that's where people really struggle that a hazard just becomes the risk. Whereas, well, yep. no, risk is measured severity versus likelihood you've just written a hazard down there and that's just anything could be a hazard and then we have to kind of look at it from a how likely is that and yes there's impact factors increasing that likelihood or increasing the severity of whatever it might be but i find that a real area that people struggle with have, have you found that and discovered that yourself as well 
Absolutely. And if you think about it, Andy, you could have a risk assessment for absolutely every single thing, couldn't you? And they would be hundreds of pages long because, as you said, you look at them and the hazards, you're thinking, oh, this could happen, that could happen. Oh, I heard this. That might happen. Or they might be involved in this. And all of a sudden it becomes a bit um, unmanageable. And we always try and go back to, you know, try and stick to the the facts and the Mm. the what we know and and kind of move from there. And again, keeping it individual individualized so you know mm. you're not doing a risk assessment for someone based on oh that happened to that person there so i need to put it all in what do you know about that particular person do you think um so it's kind of drawing to a bit of a close on the session a little bit um as far as obviously you deliver safeguarding training um we deliver safeguarding training as well and i think there's you know like like in everything there's there's good and bad in <laughs> you know for me sometimes i feel like uh, some places, not all places, some people take, some places take their safeguarding very, very seriously and they're really genuinely trying to do their best and make it right. I think for some, it is a tick box exercise to some degree or another. Um, What would your advice be regarding an organization's kind of approach to safeguarding training specifically, but maybe even to the nature of the safeguarding training they should be looking for? I would say, and of course, we know there are certain things that have to be covered on a regular basis. You know, so I know there are certain bits, but I think tailoring it to your organisation and trying to include case studies or interactions so that people aren't just sitting there listening, try and get some involvement, um, encourage participants, if you know who who are coming along, you know, get them to bring something with them, actively encourage them to to share stories, you know, anonymise stories, because I feel that that's what really aids the discussion. Um, And, you know, I'm always so keen to share um, my story in lots of different ways. And it's not about making it about me. It's an experience that actually I feel everyone can learn from. And I think in in safeguarding training, it just adds a different layer to it. So the the more interaction you can get, and I know that in all of my training, there's not always interaction, that there isn't, there's bits that we can improve on. But when we do add the case studies, the stories, you, you can really feel the difference, but everyone can offer something and everyone has lots of different um, sort of levels and experiences of safeguarding. Some people are working directly with children, some aren't. So it's about getting the balance right and making it relevant to the people you've got in the room. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Hayley. Um, hopefully you feel like you've you've had a chance to chat about everything that you kind of, obviously the, the passion is out there. So hopefully people have kind of picked up some bits that you've kind of mentioned and can kind of run with a little bit. Is there anything that you wanted to add at all? Or is there anything that we you don't feel we've covered? No, it's been fantastic. And there's always something we can talk about in yeah, terms absolutely. of safeguarding. We'll always come back. Um, but I just really... Just to end, a massive thank you to you, but also just to anyone who's listening or who's, you know, working in safeguarding, reach out, make sure you've got supervision, that your own well-being is supported. You know, if you're not sure in your agencies, you know, what's available, ask them. Um, take a look at the toolkit and also the Cognus website. As I said, there are lots of services and support out there um, if you know where to find it. Uh, yeah, definitely. You. I think it's... Um... And one of the things I think would be interested, Hayley, and if you'd be interested, we'll we'll kind of uh, look at collaboration or doing a chat again in the future. But one of the things I'd love to get, and and for anybody listening or watching this, you know, send us a comment, send us a message to podcast.able-training.co.uk. If you'd be interested in a kind of a Q&A session, we could potentially organise a live or something like that where, or pop it in the comments. And if, if we get enough kind of questions, then we'll, we'll get Hayley back and we'll, we'll have a conversation. Or if she'll come back, we'll have to see. <laughs> but um, yeah, see if we can find out this information and ask those specific questions. If you've got a difficult case or you've had a situation you didn't know what to do in the past and you would like to have done, or you're looking to improve uh, the practice of your your home setting or organisation, um, I think it'd be always worthwhile. So yeah, please reach out to us because that's what the the idea of these podcasts is for really, is to to build better networks, better connection and better support for for those in care, for those caring. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining me today, Hayley. I'll let you uh, crack on with the rest of your weekend. Thank you <laughs> we'll so sort of- much for your time.